Hey, welcome to the broadcast. My name is Jeremy Fine. I'm the pastor here at Accelerate Church, and this is my wife. Hi, I'm Erin, and we are so excited here at Accelerate Church that you have joined and tuned in today. And we invite you to come sometime. Just come visit us. We'd love to have you and see you. And I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit has a word just for you today. You may be going through all kinds of things in life, but if you will tune in to His voice and His word, He has your answer. That's right. If you can't join us in person at 10 a.m. on Sundays at 4400 South Crockett, then you ought to go to our website, AccelerateChurch.cc. We have all our sermons there, and you can watch our services live and be a part of what God is doing here at Accelerate Church. But right now, we're going to get into the word today. Most Christians say they believe God. That's a good thing. Demons believe and tremble. You got to believe God. If you don't believe God, then you're below a demon level faith. But those that walk in a continuous victory parade are those that live fully convinced. I'm going to repeat that because sometimes you think I'm just maybe saying some words, but you need to catch the spirit that's behind this. Most Christians say they believe God. That's good. You need to believe God. But those that walk in a continuous victory parade are those who are fully convinced that God is who he says he is. They're fully convinced that God can do what God said he can do. They're fully convinced that they can do what God said they can do. But I will tell you up front, there's a lot of Christians that will mentally acknowledge the truth you've already heard about being fully convinced but they're not fully convinced. See, the way you live tells on yourself. Yeah, it tells on you. Your life is a testimony that anyone could read if they're paying attention. But what is it people see when they read your testimony, your life? Abraham, the father of the faith, had many sons. And many sons had father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm. Left arm. Right foot. Left foot. Father Abraham. How many sons? You know it? How many sons? Look at you. I am one of them. Yeah. Turn around. Sit down. Okay. Don't you wish you'd made it to Sunday school? That's where you learn those type of things. Some people are in here like, what on earth is going on? Why do we call Abraham the father, really, of us all? Well, he's the father of the Jews because Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. God changed his name to Israel. Did you see the news about what's happening in Israel? Only God would set it up where I'm talking about the call of God on television here locally this morning and start talking about the rapture, seeming like a rabbit trail that I got on. Jesus is coming. Yeah, yeah I'm proclaiming this on, on television. And as soon as I go off, meet the press comes on, and all they can show is everything going on in Israel. They said yesterday, quote, we are at war. Boy, I hope you're paying attention. You know, these aren't just theories that we've looked at about end times. We're not wasting our time studying the Word of God. We're preparing to be about our Father's business because the King is soon to return. Yeah. Don't you forget that. That's on the forefront of everything we do here at Accelerate. I'm telling you. The name Accelerate Church shows you we're an end time remnant church. You've got to be ready. Too many people are playing games in their relationship with God. I don't even know who all's here this morning, who's watching this, who's hearing this by radio, but somebody's playing games with God. This is burning in me. It's time to stop. It's time to get real. It's time to not care what people think. It's time to press into the things of the kingdom. Time is short. And you've got to be fully convinced that God is who he revealed himself to be in the Bible. Yeah. You've got to be all in. It's dangerous if you're playing Texas Hold'em to be all in. Right? I don't recommend it. don't recommend playing that at all. But I can tell you this. Uh, that whole point of that is you're all in. Ooh, that catches people's attention. The risk is high. You must think you have a good hand, right? Well, guess what? When you find what the Word says about you, you might as well say, I'm all in on this. 
I'm all in. Listen, there is no other king who died for you. There is no other living king who reigns forever and through eternity, who died on the cross for you and rose again. There is no other way. All the religions in this world following their way is the wrong way. There's one way. It's Jesus. There's only one way to heaven. And Abraham was in covenant with God. That's why we call him Father Abraham. That's why we sing that little song and made you feel awkward this morning. (laughs) Some of y'all are like, well, that already happened 30 minutes ago. It's all good. Abraham is the father of those that live by faith. He's the father of the Jews, but he's the father of those who live by faith. Amen. That means he's your father. Way back there. God grafted it in so that you, though you may not be a natural Jew, have been grafted in, praise the Lord. Romans chapter 4 talks about this. Say, thank God for the Word. The Word is alive this morning. Romans chapter 4, verse 19, is talking about Abraham. That's why I brought him up. Let's look at this. Abraham, not being weak in faith, did not consider his own body. Already dead since he was about 100 years old. Now, let me give you a tiny backstory to this. He's believing God for a child. Because God had blessed him so much. I mean, everywhere he went, he was blessed. Because he was a tither. He was just blessed everywhere he went. He was a tither. Praise God, he tithed to Melchizedek. Isn't that something? And you can read that story. Well, Abraham's blessed, he's blessed, he's blessed. But then he goes to the Lord and he says, the Lord, Now, Lord, I'm blessed on every hand, but I don't have anyone to give this inheritance to. And see, I'm going to be talking to you as we wind down this year and go into the new year. What are we even doing here at Accelerate Church? You see, we got to build something that's a lasting legacy that lasts beyond our lifetimes. Somebody said, I thought you said Jesus is coming. He is. But we're going to be building what he told us to build until the day he comes, which could be today. I'm staying excited about it. Don't let it depress you. You might as well smile and get excited about it. But Abraham believed God, and from the time he was 75 years old to now he's near 100, he had believed God for a child. That's a long time, especially in a microwave generation as we look back on that now. Abraham didn't have microwaves. You do. Most of you, plural, have microwaves, been around them. Now, I like microwaves. You go, doot, 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 hit start, it cooks it, boom, ready to go. That's made us think that's how it is with God. Well, I'm going to tithe, and then I'm going to watch God do something. Well, you're going to watch God do something, but what you need to do is keep your hand on the plow and keep going and watching, and God's going to work. Amen. You know what I like about the tithe is that you pay ahead of time. It's different than insurance. Insurance, you know, they always pay after the disaster. The tithe blocks those disasters from happening. Praise God. So therefore, you don't see a lot of what happens when you tithe. God being a shield in front of you, like a kind of I'm seeing like a snow plow. We don't have a whole lot of those around here, but if you see a snow plow, I was up in the mountains and some rocks had fallen off on the highway, and I mean we they had just fallen because we were coming around driving around, and it looked like they had just fallen because people were swerving, and I thought, well, those huge boulders they hadn't been there all day because there's semis and a lot of trucks that go by. Well, I mean we go up the mountain, turn around, come back, and here comes a snow plow to go snow plow those rocks. He had a big shield in front of him that was like this. So he could just go and get them boulders right on out of there. That's God in your life when you follow him. He's a shield in front of you. When you're a tither, there goes the devourer in his plan, left and right. Just flying all around you, but it's not hitting you, praise God. (laughs) Abraham knew something about it. He's believing God, and he did not consider his own body already dead. Now he's about 100, and Not to mention the deadness of Sarah's womb, Romans 4, verse 20. One of my favorite passages in the Bible says this. He did not waver, King James says, stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, giving us a pattern of how we have to live. Why do you allow voices in your life that weaken your faith? You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. 
The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. For Abraham not to waver means he had to remind himself of those pictures that God had painted in his mind. See, faith always sees the promise. God never expects you to walk around blind. No, faith isn't blind. Faith sees what God said and keeps your eye on what God said. He didn't waver. He didn't stagger at the promise of God. You're going to have a child. Now it's been years. Hey, it would have been a miracle for him to have a child when he was 75 and Sarah was 65. She hadn't given him a child all through her 20s and 30s and 40s. That would have been a miracle right then from the moment God spoke it. But from the moment God spoke it, it's going to be done. You just got to hold on to what God said. Not get into unbelief. Unbelief isn't always disbelief, it's believing the wrong thing many times. So see, he didn't start believing the wrong thing. He he was tempted to, but he didn't. Instead, he strengthened himself in his faith. That's what you're doing here this morning. Amen? Strengthened himself in in the faith. So, So let me say this again. Why do you allow voices in your life that weaken your faith? Why? When are you going to learn? you got to cut some voices out if you're going to get the results that Abraham got. He gave glory to God. Look at verse 21. Here's the point. And being fully convinced. Say it with me. Fully convinced. Here we go. Fully convinced. He was fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able to perform. See, he didn't know how. 75, he gets the promise. Now he's about 100. That's almost 25 years. How on earth are you going to do it now? God has a knack for waiting for you to finally get to a point where you realize, oh, it's impossible. Any other way but with God. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible if you believe. You see, you get out of believing. You get out of being fully convinced. And you say, I don't know if God's ever going to perform his promise. Oh, he's well able. But are you fully convinced? See, there's two sides. God is able, but are you fully convinced? He was fully convinced, and therefore, verse 22, Romans 4 says, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Well, then, who was it for? But also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Glory to God. See, Abraham was fully convinced, meaning he was completely 100% certain about what God promised and that God was able to do it. This tells me something. The enemy is going to pick on those with the least amount of revelation knowledge. The least amount of knowledge is a dangerous place to be because the enemy can come and pick on you and you don't know whether it's the enemy or God. You'd end up living like Job, who was a blessed man because he didn't curse God even though he didn't understand. Now see, instead of putting Job as your model, the only part of his life that you should model is the part that he was blessed and that he never cursed God. But there's some things that are written in the book of Job that will confuse a brother or a sister if they don't read the rest of the Bible. And see, several years ago, it's been now probably a decade or two ago, There was a song that swept through Christianity, you know, I will bless his holy name, you know. And uh, I don't want to go more into it. I'm not trying to blast the people that wrote it. All I'm trying to say is people started quoting Job thinking they're bringing God praise. And I was like, oh, that's ignorance. Gone to seed. You got to be careful that your praise isn't ignorance. You got to know what God said. That's the reason you shout. You don't just shout because, well, they're shouting. I think I'll shout. You know, people at a football game, they know when to shout and when to shut up. If we can be smart enough to go to a football game. And by the way, a lot of them drink. I remember I went to that Cowboys game several years ago. This is several years ago. DeMarcus Ware played for him, And they thought he broke his neck and he was laid out. And I was at that game and I mean, it was silence in the stadium. Silence. Everybody's sitting there. The guy behind me so drunk, he's like, what's going on? How come they're not playing? And he's wearing a Dallas Cowboy jersey. I'm like, our best defensive player 
is hurt pretty serious. In other words, shh. That's not the time to be cheering. You got that? People get it in a game. But as a Christian, again, I referenced this earlier, we're on a continuous victory parade. There's always a reason to shout as a Christian. Yeah, there's always a reason. So then, you know, Christians come to church. They come to a place like this, and you see, there's a lot of people that shout here, but there are some dead ones amongst us that say, I don't get this. This isn't my style. I used to be you. Here I am now pastoring this wild bunch here <laughs> that believes God and is fully convinced. I'll tell you right now, at a football game, the whole crowd shouts when they are fully convinced their team has won. Yeah. When they're fully convinced, they shout. When they're not, they're serious. Are you listening to me? It's the same with you in your Christian life. When you're fully convinced that you're going to win, you shout. But when you're down and depressed, I can tell you right now, you're not fully convinced. That's a, the that's a problem. Abraham was fully convinced, completely certain about what God had said and that God was able to do what he said. He was persuaded. He was focused on God and God's ability. Are you? I want to read Romans 4.21 out of the contemporary English version. It says, Abraham was certain that God could do what he had promised. God's word translation says it like this, Romans 4.21. And he was absolutely confident that God would do what he promised. You see, when you are fully convinced, you are certain. Yeah. You are absolutely confident. In fact, I will say this many times, a lack of confidence reveals a lack of faith. It's hard to separate the two. See, you may not realize this, but the enemy is targeting your confidence in God's word and him being able to do it. You see, if someone's always got to come and crank your chain to get you stirred back up to believe God, that lets you know you're not fully convinced. So I'll just let you know right now, the fully convinced crowd is very minor in the body of Christ overall. And to be honest with you, when someone's this certain, this absolute confidence just emits from them, most other people think it's arrogance. Most other people think, and this will be what they say, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know what that is? That is a whisper from the devil himself. I'll tell you who I am. You start saying what the word says. Let me tell you, if you start saying what the word says, I'm born again. I'm more than a conqueror. Praise God. I always win in Christ. It won't be long. You get out two or three people are like, okay, okay, all right, all right. They don't really want to know because you're fully convinced reveals they're halfway convinced. On the second and fourth Sunday nights of every month, we have LifeLinks. We gather together with like-minded believers and discuss the current series that Pastor Jeremy is preaching. We have food, we laugh together, we pray together, and we build those godly relationships with our brothers and sisters within the church. We would love for you to join us for LifeLinks. You can find a list of all of our groups along with their locations on our app, our website, or just stop by the desk in the lobby. We have someone there ready to help you find the perfect LifeLink group. The more of the Word of God that is in you, the more confident you get every day when you wake up. You don't have a down Monday because you know this is a Monday where I'm victorious in Christ Jesus. I don't care what hell's bringing my way. I don't care what people are saying. I'm not absolute confident in what they're saying. I'm confident in what God said. Whew. Praise God. That's a different way of living. So the enemy, he's going to target your confidence because he knows there's a great reward attached. Hebrews chapter 10, write this down, verse 35 says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. By default, when one is fully convinced, they will be confident. The reason I'm saying this, I'm not talking about something I figured out when I was in high school. Where I could just act the part and people thought I was confident. That's the way a lot of people live still to this day. 
Kind of makes you wonder, does high school ever really end? Yes, it does. Quicker than you want. But the attitudes people have sometimes. See, I learned in high school, finally in my junior year, if I act confident, everybody will think I'm confident, and then I can become popular. It's exactly what happened. Before that, I didn't act confident, so guess what? No one thought I was confident. No one was really drawn to that. People are drawn to confidence. I'm not just talking about high school. You could write that down. That's a powerful truth. People are drawn to confidence, especially in God. See, so I'm not talking about you're confident because you got your new hairdo or you got you some new clothes on. And some people, they put their, that's what gives them confidence. And I'm confident in what I'm wearing. Well, what if I'm not? See, my confidence doesn't rely on what I wear. My confidence is a byproduct of being fully convinced of what God said and that his, he is able to do what he said. I hope you're catching this. Confidence almost becomes a byproduct. It's not something you manufacture is what I'm preaching to you. You can't manufacture this confidence. Now, there's people that are arrogant. But see, this confidence has a humility about it because you humbly receive what God said about you. You're confident in what God said about you. Wow. We've got to be confident enough to act on the Word of God no matter the consequences. I heard a great man of God, my pastor, say this, and I always am ready to write down what he says. He made this statement to me. Oh, it's been a month ago. But he said humans many times are moved more by self-convincing than anything else. I wrote it down like this. Humans many times are moved by more by what they convince themselves of than anything else. And I'll tell you, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing because you can convince yourself of almost anything. There's a scripture that just kind of rings in my ears, especially after hearing Pastor Darren come and preach on Wednesday night. Wasn't that a powerful message here Wednesday night? Take heed, those of you that stand, lest you fall. In other words, you got to pay attention. I'm glad you're standing and having done all stand, keep doing that. But take heed, lest you fall. Pay attention to what God said. Keep your eye on what he said. And when you do that, a confidence that's supernatural in nature, it's not fleshy. That's why I'm taking time in this part of the service to tell you this. This isn't a fleshy thing of, yeah, I'm confident, everybody likes me. And this ain't nothing like that. This is, you're fully convinced what God said and that he's able to do it. And the byproduct of that is you have this solid, legit confidence in God. Nothing flaky about this at all. But humans many times are more moved by self-convincing than anything else in their life. They convince themselves, some do, that I'm exempt from what God said. You know, Paul told the Colossians, they'll take out the fact that the Holy Spirit inspired this, to set their affection on things above, not on things on this earth. But that was for the Colossians. I'm American. Well, see, when you start doing that, you're saying that you're not fully convinced this is for you anyway. You're one step away from believing what's a growing trend in this nation in church to say, well, this is the enemy of our future, the Bible. It's not. This is your only hope of any future with God. And you better hold to it. I don't care what the American culture says about you. What does that matter anyway? If you're going to be fully convinced of what God said, it doesn't matter what this culture says. It doesn't matter. The Word must be your regulating principle in life. Yeah. What is the principle you go by? What determines right or wrong in your life? Well, I think that's wrong. I think that's right. You see, some people, they don't like it. They, God's not about a bunch of commands. So I guess that means you're okay if someone comes and steals everything in your account. Well, no, I'm against that. Oh, so you're a hypocrite. See, people, they, they define hypocrite the wrong way. They don't like the do's and don'ts when it applies to them until something happens to them.
You don't want someone to come murder your family and you, do you? Of course not. It's against the word. I, I could go on, but I think you're starting to get the point. You know, people are like, well, it's, you know, I know the Bible says all liars have their part in the lake of fire, but I believe God's merciful. Well, if you repent and stop lying, yes, but you can't keep lying and think you're going to sell through the gates of heaven. Well, it's a little white light. Well, what if someone lies to you? Well, that's wrong. That's what I'm talking about is hypocritical. It's either wrong for everybody or it's not. Now, we've all broken God's law. This is why we cling to a Savior. But the only way He can be our Savior is for Him to be our Lord. One of the basics I thank God I learned years ago as a really young teenage Christian was that it's not taught in the Bible that He's our Savior before He's our Lord. That can't be. And you will hear this. People say it all the time. He was my Savior, then I made Him my Lord years later. Didn't happen. Glad you didn't die during that time period. The only way He's your Savior is if He is your Lord. That means your boss. He's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. I approve this message. May not go over big, but it's true. So the Word must be my regulating principle in all of my conduct. The Word. The Word must be my regulating principle in all of my conduct. Well, some still convince themselves. Well, I'm exempt from that. Others convince themselves. See, they take it to a higher degree. God doesn't exist. Well, how foolish could you be? Right? The fool has said, God, there is no God. <laughs> well, what regulates that type of person, by the way? You know what I'm saying? What is it that they determine right and wrong by? Now, let me ask you this question. What is your aim in life? I'm asking you this because to be fully convinced in what God said, you're going to have to have your aim on, on pleasing God. Can I exhort you today to aim high? Aim high. How do you do that? you got to aim to please God. Young people in the back, pay attention. If your aim is to please people more than to please your Lord and Savior, you're in trouble. you got to get rid of this. I want to tell you this. you got to get rid of wanting to please people. If you don't get rid of that, you're never going to be fully convinced because you're going to look at what people say. Pastor Jeremy here. That's all the time we have today. So I hate to interrupt myself preaching there, but we had a good time today. Yes, we did. And we invite <laughs> you to come in person. Come see us. Stop by and say, hey, Pastor Jeremy. Hey, Miss Erin. I saw you on TV because we would love to meet you Absolutely. and shake your hand. Absolutely. And be sure and tune in again next time on the same station, same time for the Accelerate Church television broadcast.